Hi everyone, it is somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.58 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on November the 19th in the supposed year of 2017. Uh, I guess uh, today I, I might be just continuing on the series of um, They're Hiding Yahweh, Not With a Globe, because this... Uh, Everything I talk about today, in some way or another, it's it's going to be a, a branch of that, and it's going to directly relate back to what I was saying in those two videos. Um, this video, though, um, the best I can foresee, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, and this is going to be kind of like a, a WikiLeaks leaks dump in the sense that I've got so much going on here in many directions and new information that has enlightened me and a lot of it's just fragmentary so I'm going to unload about everything I can uh, all that I've got so that I can help you to understand what are some serious core issues that relate back to what I've been saying in the first two videos in this series that I made. I want to do everything that I possibly can to communicate to you The seriousness of these matters, they're not, these aren't issues that are really debatable as far as I can see it. If they were issues that were up for debate and discussion, I'd be pretty clear about that. I don't have any desire to get people um, to follow my mode of thought or any of my personal subjective beliefs. So whenever I encounter information that opposes anything that I do yet believe or things that I've found or uh, a course that I'm currently on, I do try to offer it uh, as quickly and clearly as I can to facilitate you in doing your own work because we're all expected to do our own work. Those who call themselves truth seekers those who affirm their belief in the Word, say they, they love the Word, they say they love God, Yahweh, His Messiah, Yahshua, Jesus, yet they do no work on their own. They put nothing in, uh, in any way, but just simply take. Lest there be certain extenuating circumstances, um, I would say that all that person is, is a, a user and a taker and an eater, and they give nothing back. So the reason I, I do these things is because I don't believe in that system where one or two people, uh, do all the work and uh, a bunch of other people pay them for their time to, to do this stuff and then they dictate to them their personal mindset or beliefs or what have you. That system doesn't work because there's no checks and balances. Everybody has to put a certain amount of time into this so that there can be 
those checks and balances so that we can eventually come to some kind of unity in what the truth is. The less people we have arguing any given topic, um, the more likely it's going to be that, say, the very few people arguing it, discussing it, or teaching on it could be wrong. And who's going to watch the watchers? So where to begin? Where to begin is a good question. I've spent almost all my time uh, from the publication of my last video in this series not only looking over archaeological finds, uh, digs and events and evidence and trying to formulate a, uh, a type of chart that could help anyone who wants to help out, be involved in uh, verifying these archaeological finds. And, and these archaeological finds, they, they all have to do with the discovery of items that show what is either called ancient Hebrew or proto sunniatic and sometimes Phoenician text types, uh, the characters, so that we can know what the source character and thus language uh, is for the Hebrew scriptures, which is the complete foundation and basis of what so many claim to be their New Testament faith. If you don't have a proper understanding of the Hebrew scriptures, I say that you're not going to have a proper understanding of the Greek writings in the New Testament if they were ever written in Greek uh, in the first place. So let's start out with your Bible. Um, unless you may be one of the very, very, very few who happen to own and read a Bible that is pulled predominantly from single-source manuscript. You are reading a Bible that has come down to you through filter after filter after filter. You are most likely not reading something that comes from a pure source. And I'm going to illustrate this to you so you understand what it is that you're reading these days. Now, consider this. Those people who are, say, connoisseurs of strong liquors, you know, you'll oftentimes hear people who, who are connoisseurs of strong drink talk uh, very highly of single malt drinks, specifically like a, a single malt scotch. And this would be because if you have a liquor, a strong drink, and something that is uh, so specific in the way it's made or could be made as scotch, because scotch, which is just Scottish, whiskey is made or malted by various peoples in various regions uh, using various methods. If you get a bottle that's a single source, single malt uh, scotch or whiskey, what have you, you know that depending on who it is, You'll know the, the grain they use, uh, the methods that they uh, would use uh, for processing it and getting it ready for uh, distillation. You would know the 
uh, distillation methods that they use and materials. You would understand what fuels they use um, and what sort of uh, aging um, devices uh, that they're employing. What sort of barrels? Where did they get them from? Where were they before? There's so much to it that if you get a single malt, you know that it's going to have such a specific character to it that you couldn't mistake it. But if you get one that incorporates many various um, malts or distillations, various batches, what happens is, although you may still be getting uh, liquor and it, it may all be um, the same uh, in uh, that they're using, of course, similar grains and methods and aging uh, techniques and containers, it's not going to be distinct like that single malt. And what happens is when you start blending various malts, you get confusion. Well, the same thing happens with how we're receiving our Bibles, where we're getting it from, and what it's going through, and how there is now confusion. For those of you who are not very familiar with textual criticism, there are many uh, men and women who make a good living today at being textual critics, not only in theological seminaries, but in secular universities uh, and as uh, independent authors. There are many textual critics out there. What textual critics will do, uh, what they prefer to do, this is the uh, this is the standard preferred method today. They will take various texts and they will choose readings from all of those various texts and they will grade those readings because what they'll do is they typically work in committee. Uh, very seldomly will a single translator do a singular unique translation. It's typically done by committee and today more than ever most Bible translations that you'll see coming out are going to be uh, pulling from in the New and the Old Testament. They're going to be pulling from pretty much standards that have been developed with various readings from Nestle Allen or United Bible Society. They have been doing this for some time with not only the Old Testament, because there are different codices that exist. Uh, also, there is the Septuagint, and there are uh, various readings available from the Dead Sea Scrolls concerning the so-called Old Testament. With the New Testament, the amounts of readings available for various books are pretty vast. In the what is called majority text type alone, there are thousands. So they'll go through all of these things, and this is really the expertise that the textual critic has. It is their uh, their value and their specific function that they know and understand all of these various. Um, popular and obscure texts, uh, papyri, um, vellums, and parchments, and codices uh, written on various types of, of paper and other materials. They, they log them and they name them. They... Uh, it, uh, they get to know them very well. 
and they employ textual criticism from one to the other. There is, if you, if you want to understand more about textual criticism or how our current Bibles have come down to us and those methods used, I would suggest anyone go to this YouTube channel. For one, it's got 177 subscribers, which is less than I have, and I think I have very few, I guess, in relationship to what a lot of channels have that produce nothing but garbage. They only have 177 subscribers, and the videos and playlists that you can find on this channel are beyond any value that you can put on them. Yes, you will find lectures by Bart Ehrman. You will find lectures by a number of people who maybe they don't think that certain portions of the Bible are inspired. Um, but there is a series that you can find on here called Lost Christianities. I would recommend anyone out there go through these lost Christianities. Go through the lectures by these textual critics uh, and historians and authors on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there, there's so much here. Uh, it, it's such a valuable resource. Uh, what you can, what you can acquire, and all of these people that that they're highlighting in this video section as I roll through. These are people who are going to give you uh, a whole lot of insight on the process of textual criticism of the Bible. So you need to understand that when you're reading virtually any version of the Bible, and that most specifically does apply to the King James Version, you are reading various texts and various readings that people who are employed as textural critics have gone through and pulled out what readings they like the best and what they agree upon the most. And then they choose how to translate that into the given language, and in this case it's English. And then oftentimes you'll have those who go over and do blanket edits concerning text and flow and readability and understandability. And in the case of King James, I would say that there's, I would say at least the rumors about the King James uh, secret editor-in-chief are worth looking at for how our English language has developed and come down to us over 400, 500 years to today. Anything that's been developed in the last four to 500 years, I think we should take a very, um, very close, very critical look at. So what I'm trying to tell you is this. You're not getting single source documents. You would have to specifically look for and acquire uh, certain codices and parchments, papyri, etc., and read them yourself and translate them to the best of your ability without, and here's the kicker of all of this, the kicker that the textural critics who oftentimes live a, a very good life where people pay them a great deal of respect for their uh, vast knowledge and insight. This is that little bit of information that I haven't heard any of them talk about. And that is that with all of the textual critics out there, all of them, 
and unless we're talking about a few that I'm not very aware of, all of them, without exception, are deferring back to the lexicon of the Masoret. For their understanding of the source text. I want to make that abundantly clear. Even if we're talking about a textual critic who would um, support or affirm the value or veracity of, say, any Septuagint, then all they've got to work from is the Greek. They're going to have to equate that Greek at some point to the Hebrew. And when they get to the Hebrew, they will have to defer to the Masoretic, to their understanding of what the Hebrew is and what the Hebrew says. Because again, what they're not mentioning is that none of them understand the source language as something that should be viewed as icons with inherent meaning. Not one of them view the source language in that way. And those very few that do and who they're not given any sort of um, respect or um, none of the so-called popular textual critics today are going to give them the time of day. But even those people that I'm aware of, for the most part, are either gatekeepers or they're just um, con artists because I've been reviewing what they either believe or have published as being the inherent meanings of the Hebrew characters and it doesn't work. I've been applying their uh, definitions of what the Hebrew characters mean inherently and it doesn't work. It's confusion. Again. But I'm going to tell you this. And I want you to. I want you to really file this in your mind. As an absolute inescapable truth. And it's a truth that you have to deal with. When you are reading the Bible. And that is this. If we don't have some way to discover, to understand the inherent meaning of the Hebrew language, then all we have, and I repeat, all we have, is what men say those words, those letters, and those phrases, those books mean. All we have is the word of men telling us what those things mean. And if you do a little digging on the Masoretes and you read documents by not only them, but others who have studied the Masoretic texts and their Nikud, they will tell you the same thing, that their understanding of the text, as well as pronunciation, syllable stress, and uh, then their cantillations that they, they added to, all come by way of tradition. 
That's exactly what you're going to get. And that's as far and deep as you're going to get. Now, what do you want? Do you want to keep reading a Bible that not only is given to you from multiple textural sources that some textual critic or critics have chosen multiple variant readings from and then decided how they want to translate it. And of course, in many instances, they're going to have to translate it to about, what is it? It's over 5% variance that they're going to have to have in their wording to make sure they don't infringe on any current copyrights. This whole time, of course, their lexiconic understanding, their understanding of the definitions and usages of the words are coming from a a heritage and heritage of people who have by the time it's said that they developed their Masoretic uh, Nikud system and we don't have any texts before that other than what was probably begrudgingly given up in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in various archaeological finds. That's all we have besides the Masoretic tradition. Men who, by that time, if they really did develop this between the 7th and 10th centuries, which I'm not sure ever actually occurred, you've got men who had for, what, 7 to 10 centuries, had a tradition of absolute abhorrence to Yeshua of Nazareth. Him who is called the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, who a a whole new and distinct branch of what many consider Judaism came from, uh, although that in and of itself is confusion, because we tend to confuse true belief of Yahweh and um, all of his words uh, given down to Moses and all of the subsequent historians and prophets after him and then coming to us later on in the last days through his son Yeshua of Nazareth. That is the true follower and worshiper of the true God of Israel. Judaism has nothing to do with that. Judaism has everything to do with adding to and taking away from the word. That is precisely the people who developed the Masoretic text. It is those people that in Yahshua's day were known for adding to and taking away from the word. And although there's a lot to be said concerning who the enemies of Yahweh are, who the enemies of Messiah are. Know this, that for one thing, and I haven't made up my mind 100%, concerning um, this idea that uh, today's Jews are actually uh, for the most part, Edomites. And I, I bring that up because for one thing of Old Testament prophecies concerning Edom, and for another thing of what Yahweh says about Edom to Israel. And then what we see in Revelation, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily say that it would be <clears throat> Edom that would be rising up uh, against well, the camp of the saints, we'll say that. In the last days, it says Gog and Magog, the chief prince of 
Meshach, and Tubal. And if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, it gives a number of other nations that are involved in this confederacy against, as it's put in our translations of Revelation, <laughs> the camp of the saints. Now that aside, because I know that a lot of people who are into identity and everything, they'll, they'll equate the people today that call themselves Jews with Edom. They'll, it'll be a full, equal equation. And I don't think that that is quite the case, although I believe it's in there, absolutely, because for one thing, Encyclopedia Judaica does say that Edom is in modern Jewry. It's in there because back when the Romans were occupying Judea, and I'm going to put it right out there, I'm still not convinced that Palestine is the area in which these things happen. I know a lot of people would say that that's, that's quite impossible. And I'm not sure that that's quite impossible. When you start weighing the record and you start looking at um, alternate historians and what they have to say about the happenings in that area, and then you look at how silent things are concerning other areas of the world that, that have... <laughs> um, that have at least on the ground a lot of evidence that societies, even advanced societies, existed in those locations for quite a long time. So things, they're not, they don't come together. They don't entirely add up. Okay? So I am still currently not fully convinced that all these things happened in that area, modern day Palestine. But, anyways, wherever. Whether it was there, somewhere else, that's not the main issue. When the Romans occupied Judea, there was a large area um, that bordered on Judea that was pretty much annexed area known as Idumea, and it was full of Edomites, traditionally, ethnically. Edomites. It is believed that many of these Edomites had integrated themselves into the house of Judah uh, in one way or another. Now, was this done through uh, John Hyrcanus? Uh, would he have been opposed? greatly by uh, a number of purists in his day, probably. Um, it would have been unprecedented had he done that, what it is said he, he did, where he offered many uh, Edomites at the time of um, his leadership of the Hasmonean dynasty, which would be the dynasty that was handed down uh, from Judah Maccabee. Um, essentially Jewish citizenship. Um, and uh, apparently then they would have to circumcise and do other things, you know. Uh, how much to that it do I think is, is historical and could have happened? I'm not sure because I do understand the mindset, for instance, of the Pharisees that uh, began as a sect a long time before John Hyrcanus was a leader uh, in Judea. Uh, they probably would have opposed something like this. Um, but then again, by the time of, of Yahshua's day, if uh, all the records are accurate, um, when he is denouncing them, he does tell them that they would traverse land and sea to make one proselyte or convert uh, and it would certainly seem that these converts they were making were, um, did not specifically have to be of the house of Judah. So, in that day, it's hard to say. You know, the Pharisees accused Joshua of being, remember, they said, are, are we not wrong in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? 
to call somebody who was of the house of Judah a Samaritan would be to say to them that you are not a pure blood uh, Judahite, but you are a mamzer, a mixer, mixed breed. So, um, although it does seem that the Pharisees did that as far as making converts and proselytes, uh, I don't know that it was ever considered an okay thing for somebody to say, well, I am going to uh, circumcise and do all of these other things, and then I'm going to be considered a Jew, a, a Judahite, or Benjamite, or Levite. You remember, they were distinct tribes. They were always distinct tribes. And even when Yahweh, in the so-called Old Testament, tells them uh, his law at different times, he gives them laws and statutes and judgments concerning those who are not Israelites. And he does say that there will be various non-Israelites that would get inheritances with Israelites. But he never says that they will be considered part of any particular tribe, um, but that they would gain an inheritance among them. That doesn't mean that he ever uh, promoted um, marriage or, or procreation between different races, or let's just say outside of the stock of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, to try to make a long story short, we have by record, small record, but record, that Idumea, Edomites, were, were pushing their way in more and more to the house of Judah, and if you want to call it uh, that religion. Uh, in fact, uh, it is on record that during the revolt in 70 AD, and remember, there were skirmishes leading up to it. There were skirmishes afterwards. There were events, but two big events that really marked some major things happening in the house of Judah that the house of Edom would have to have played a role in over the years were first off the revolt and absolute destruction and decimation of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD because it is recorded that during that time there were uh, various factions in Jerusalem. One faction that became very strong was a faction of Idumeans, Edomites, who were going around the city and rousing the people and keeping up this, uh, this uh, revolt against Rome. And then, fast forward, and they were absolutely beaten down tremendously, by the way. Uh, the Judeans, the house of Judah, which I believe that much of the house of Judah and Benjamin and Levi existed in the land at that time, beat down tremendously. And you can bet, because this happens with traditional military defeats of the past, I'm sure to this day, it occurs when they beat down a people they understand that one of the things that is a strength of any given people is their tie to the land and one another so you can bet that there would have been at first after that first great defeat in 70 AD a great amount of exporting of the people this had been happening to both the house of Israel for a very long time and the house of Judah. And this was it. Check the, the prophecies of Daniel 9. Okay, the time allotted to the house of Judah. Which, by the way, uh, just that prophecy alone in Daniel 9 speaks against all of the uh, textual critics who believe that uh, Yahshua and uh, his doings, his history, and the history of his apostles after him was all very much contrived because all of it was fulfillment of 
the prophecies of the Hebrew Scriptures. Anyways, so you fast forward another 60 years, and you have the Bar Kokhba revolt. This pretty much sealed the deal as far as if there were at that time still uh, members of the house of Judah and Benjamin and Levi involved in that, in the land, that would have been it. Over. Gone. They would have been massively ejected, expelled, moved around. This would have left uh, quite a big vacuum. Now, we know that for years, even for years before the birth of Yahshua the Messiah, that the house of Edom, in the form of, for example, Herod the Great, was very friendly with Rome. And I could imagine that they would have used a lot of these situations that occurred, these judgments on the house of Judah with Benjamin and Levi from Yahweh, because he determined these things to give themselves a good, strong in. Because it was prophesied that any time Edom could get up over the house of Judah, or Israel in general, they would. Now, from then till now, you've got a lot of history that has happened that has been covered up that has been, in, <clears throat> in air quotes, lost. But if we fill in the blanks, and the more we get to understand about prophecies, the more we could see the House of Edom and various other nations coming together to, over a much longer period of time now, to form uh, what is now known as modern Jewry. Now, how much of that modern Jewry is Edom? I don't know. How much of it is uh, these Khazarians? I don't know. How much of Khazaria and their whole story is absolutely contrived? I don't know. But I think maybe a lot of it is if you consider the time that supposedly this whole country converted to Judaism. Either which way, you've got uh, an entire people who claim to be the very house of Judah, Benjamin, Levi, who can't be. That's just not possible. None of them can trace their lineage back to any of the original tribes. Now, in addition, how exactly did the territory known in the time of the early Caesars as Germania, which was uh, really just a, a large conglomeration of various different tribes, how they came to be called Germania or German, Germain, is a great story in and of itself. The Goths, various tribes that gained a great deal of strength in the first four to five centuries AD. They're very interesting. I think there's a lot to that, again, that has been obscured. And what that leads to concerning the Bible and what we know about it or what we can understand about it is the fact that the last thing that you should do is trust the tradition of the Masoretes. And I know that really we don't have a lot to choose from other than uh, a couple of complete Masoretic texts, name, namely Codex Aleppo 
and Codex Leningrad, and then the Septuagint. The reason that many scholars believe that the lingua franca of Yahshua's day was Greek because they noticed that 90 something percent of all of their quotes line up very sharply with the Septuagint. But I think that's an assumption. You see, I believe that they still could have been quoting from the Hebrew Scriptures and that the Hebrew Scriptures that existed at that time would have been far more in agreement in structure and body with the Septuagint than the codices that we currently have handed down to us from the Masoretes. Now finding out a lot of this information and understanding the problems we have, I don't think that this should necessarily shake anyone's faith, although I want everyone to be very aware of what we're dealing with. Uh, I can assure you that um, no time soon will I be pulling a Bart Ehrman because I believe that men like Bart Ehrman already <clears throat> already had issues and they were looking for a way to manifest their lack of belief in the God of Israel and his Messiah. So I'm not going there. For one thing, I think even with all of the efforts that the enemies of the God of Israel and his Messiah and his people, of all of the, the techniques that they have tried to employ to obscure or hide the word of God from us, that it's just too vast and he is just too brilliant and wise to allow them to complete their wicked deeds against the word. That's why I still have faith that we can, with determination and dedication and work from everybody who claims to be a believer, figure this out. So, besides for, um, and the time between me making that last video, They're Hiding God, <clears throat> and now, um, not only have I developed, as I said, it's, uh, it's a type of, uh, checklist, a, um, a chart for archaeological finds, um, I've located lists of the most popular archaeological finds that contain um, ancient Hebrew or proto-Sinaitic uh, inscriptions and ways in which we can try to decipher how authentic those finds are because I have a suspicion right now that these finds are quite similar to the finds at Qumran, the so-called finds, which we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I don't necessarily believe that the Dead Sea Scrolls, all those fragments, are unauthentic. Uh, I believe they are authentic, but I believe the backstory and the people involved and the reason for that find being made, where it was made, and under the circumstances, all of that stinks. But if you're going to perpetrate a fraud, you need to have at least some element of that fraud uh, airtight. And I believe what was airtight was the texts themselves. In the same way, uh, I believe that's the case with a lot of archaeology. 
that has been discovered, let's just say the last two centuries. Um, why it was discovered, who it was discovered by, what ultimately it was going to be leading to. And the thing is, I again have the suspicion, although I don't have any confirmation yet, because it's going to take a lot of work. These finds are going to have to be investigated, each one of them, so that a picture can be drawn of, are we looking at some bits of archaeology that are authentic with simply finds in certain locations and at certain times which stink or not. Because if we can determine that the characters that are being found are authentic and can create a log of them, then that will go a long way towards determining the true actual meaning of the characters. And once we get that true and actual meaning of the characters, we should be able then to begin to apply them, no matter if we're applying them to, say, a, uh, a critical version of uh, the books of the Old Testament, combining readings from the, the codices or the Septuagint, Although, if you're looking at anything uh, interlinear as far as underlying Hebrew text, for the most part, you should be looking at single source. And if you're worried about whether or not it is single source, you can check to make sure that it's coming pretty much directly from, say, the Aleppo Codex or the Leningrad Codex. But we should be able to then take our understanding of the Hebrew character which will have inherent meaning and apply that to the words that we now see being represented as the underlying Hebrew and then begin to come up with what the word has always said. Remember, I can't stress this point enough that fully <laughs> fully 20% of the words being used in the whole of what we know of as the Old Testament. And uh, I am right now referring to the 39 books canonized in Aleppo Codex and Codex Leningrad. I'm not referring to, say, the Septuagint and those um, apocryphal books. Okay, right now I'm just concentrating on those 39 books in that canon. But what I'm saying is this. When we start understanding the source language and what these things really say, we're going to, I believe, start opening up an entire world of understanding. Understanding of our world. Understanding of the creation of Yahweh, Elohim, in his time frame, how he did things we'll be able to start understanding uh, how um, um, the ways in which the structure in which uh, things occurred, uh, the expressions of our God, how they have been maligned um, by not only obviously the rabbis, but all of those people who uh, sleepily confess the interpretations of Judeo Christianity. I'm going to give you a few examples of some things that I'm now finding as I work through some of the text with what bit of understanding of the source text that I have. And I, I only have some understanding of it. You see, right now, I'm still having to go through and look at words. <clears throat> and of course, I'm going to be uh, taking these words and I'm going to be translating them into uh, 
the original, the ancient Hebrew character as I know it. I'm going to be comparing those characters uh, in a number of charts and the way that they appear in a number of finds, archaeological finds over the years. And then I'm going to be cross-referencing virtually every single word so that within its context I can start to begin to understand its actual meaning and application. And you see there's more to this than just there's more to this than just uh, understanding certain source nouns or verbs and then putting them into an English context and getting some kind of actual understanding out of that. Because the whole point is this. Our English language, as it's developed over many centuries and has gotten away from its source language being Hebrew, and I can easily illustrate at any time how similar and Semitic a language English is. As it's gotten away from its source language, and as English has evolved over the years, because it's such an abstract language, it has the ability to evolve endlessly. For any of you who have read, for instance, 1984, and understand the way that Big Brother and the government was changing words and destroying words, putting out, remember, putting out new dictionaries all the time, new versions of dictionaries in which more and more and more words were destroyed. And here's the thing, they could do that. And the reason that they could destroy words and change words and dictate new meanings of words is because the source that those people had to refer to was their dictionaries, their encyclopedias, their lexicons, their concordances, their sources of knowledge. Do you see what a problem it is if we have to do the same thing with Hebrew and ultimately what we're going to end up deferring to is the Masoretes, a people and a nation whom I have no idea what they are, but I know that they hate the God of Israel. They hate his Messiah. That's not the people we want to defer to. So there's more to it, though, than just translating and understanding, say, a single subject or a single action. Enough work has to be done within these expressions, these verses, if you will, to start determining the mindset that our God, Yahweh, has and is expressing. You see, he doesn't express things the way that we're used to expressing things today because we have a bastardized language that we speak, an empty language that we speak. This was not. This language was pure, absolutely pure, with inherent meaning to everything. And it's different than our language. The way it's expressed is different than our language. The way in which the characters that make up a word interrelate to one another. The nature of an individual character, whether it be an objective subject or an objective action that's being related. All of it's different than English than the language that we speak today, or even if you speak, let's say, modern German or Russian, whatever, it's different. 
So there's also the action of getting into the mindset of our God as he relates this to us. And it takes work and it takes time and it can be daunting and it can be frustrating. In the morning, I get up hours before I have to go to work so I can work on these things. There have been mornings, no, two mornings in a row that I worked endlessly on one single word because of how important that word is to our understanding of the creation. I got to tell you that the translations that we've got, what they say concerning what happened in the first few chapters of Genesis, although I could probably extend it all the way up to the first 12 chapters of Genesis, but it gets worse the earlier the chapter, of course, because Yahweh is establishing terminologies right there in the first few chapters. If we get those wrong, we get everything else wrong. It becomes exponentially wrong. That's a big problem. So we got to get those things right. And it's going to take a while. I'm going to give you some examples here to help you understand what's going on and what some of the problems are, okay? For instance, and I'm going to be having to go back and forth between a number of softwares because I have to use so many different softwares. And by the way, I don't even have all of them up right now that I use at any given time. As a matter of fact, if I can, um, by the way, I I'm going to copy paste this channel I told you about with all of those uh, videos. Um, it's called Evangelicals, Charismatics, Christians, Blog TV, which is so strange because that title doesn't seem to reflect the material on it. But anyways, I'm going to have to get rid of that so I can bring up uh, some other screens. But I will put that, as I said, I'll put that in the description so you can go to that address and check that stuff out. Uh, and, you know something? Uh, what is it? Uh, Mozilla Firefox is... Uh, they changed their browser on me. So now i got to go to other places to find my my bookmarks, and it's, it's really daunting. So here. I'm going to make sure to bring up Bible Hub because I usually have that open too. Normally when I'm doing this study, I have two of these Q Bibles up um, in the uh, so-called Old Testament Hebrew. I have this text up, which happens to be based on the Leningrad Codex. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's called Biblia, Biblia Hebraica Stuttengardsia. It's based on the Leningrad Codex, and I can look at the actual, you know, today's Jewish character, and then, uh, translate that into the ancient Hebrew. And I have usually two to three, and usually three, blue letter Bibles up so that I can use the strong concordance application in that, because that's actually one of the the most thorough Strong's Concordance applications and easy to navigate that I'm aware of uh, online. Uh, then I'll have Bible Hub up so that I can look at the interlinear uh, because this is going to show me the uh, Hebrew words with all of the prefixes and suffixes and their um, the way that they're actually um, preserved uh, the word forms and the reason for that is because uh, and this is a this is epidemic in the hebrew scriptures you will you'll take a word uh, let's say you're reading through in something like uh, uh, esword and you come to a word that you want to do a word study on and then you would have to click the kjv plus and it has all these strong's coded numbers in here okay and um, uh, let's just say, and I'm going to be talking about Genesis, so I should be back in Genesis. 
So let's just say I want to do something like here, bara. I want to see what bara is all about. Since between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, you have at least three different words being used um, to describe creation. They're very different words, by the way. They're not cousins. They're very different. So let's say I want to check out bara. All right, well, it says it's uh, H1254. So I can go here to a blue letter Bible that has the Strong's Concordance. I got to move a couple of things around so I can run over this with you. Um, remember, I'm doing this all off the cuff. It's the best I can do. So we got H1254, and I'm going to put in a search for that. Okay, so here we go. It says bara, and it'll give you their little definitions and everything, which don't mean much as far as I'm concerned. But here's the problem. You're, if you see it in Blue Letter Bible, it's just going to give you the root, only the root bara. It's not going to give you prefixes, suffixes, or <laughs> other letters or characters which are often used in occurrences or instances of it that nobody tells you about. Strong's doesn't list those individual occurrences and how they're different. And in fact, oftentimes, certain letters are added to those different occurrences, which can change the whole meaning and intent of the word, and yet they don't tell you about that either. It's just brilliant. So, let me go back to my browser. And I'm here, I'm looking at all of the occurrences of bara here, and they're giving me all of it in Genesis and Exodus and all this. And I say, okay, you know, that's really great. So let's see what form it's in, in Genesis 1.1, since I couldn't see that in Esword. So I'll go to Bible Hub. I'll hit my interlinear. And in Genesis 1.1, I've got here, it, okay, it's in its pure form. It's uh, a so-called Bet, Resh, and Aleph, or B-R-A. And I want to see, well, is it always in that form? I mean, is it, you know, is it any other way in, in any other uh, reading of that? So I, I can scroll down here and, and look at other things. Say Deuteronomy 4.32, it, it appears there too. Go back to my uh, um, Bible Hub and go to Deuteronomy 3. It takes a second because it's got to reload all this stuff. 3, 4. And let's see if I can find it here. Do we have create, made, took them, uh-huh, try this again, oh, 432, it's easy to get distracted when you're trying to do so many things at once, okay, Deuteronomy 4, and 32, all right, and we'll find the instance of bara. oh, here we go, Cre created, and there it is, bara just like the other, although uh, many times it's going to have various different um, Masoretic uh, accent marks. They say it's for uh, proper syllable pronunciation, uh, depending on its placement in a verse and um, its use in cantillation. That's the official story. So if I keep looking through, oh, let's see. How about we try the next occurrence? It's Joshua 17.15. I want to get that right. Joshua 17.15. And go down. Joshua 17 and 15. Joshua 17.15. Hmm. Let's find it. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Barath with this uh, with this so-called tav here. 
at the end, and uh, this so-called Vav at the beginning. Ah, okay. Uberata. So that's different. That's a different form of it. But it's listed here in Strong's as just bara. But I'll tell you something. You go and you check out Hebrew prefixes and suffixes, and they'll tell you that this so-called Vav is, uh, it's typically, it's always used as a Hebrew prefix, meaning and, but that's not necessarily the case, because it can also be used to change the tense of the word. Yes, it can. And they'll give you the so-called Tav as a suffix, and they will tell you it could mean this thing if it's a noun, uh, a singular noun or a plural noun, or if it's a verb, depending on whether it's a cow perfect past or whatever. But the thing is, when you get through this exhausting list of prefixes and suffixes and what they could mean and what they could do to words, then at the very end of it, an honest person who is telling you about um, Masoretic Hebrew uh, in the Bible, then they'll tell you, of course, there are always exceptions. What they're telling you is, <laughs> it's whatever they say it is. It means whatever they say it means. I hope by this point in time you have a serious problem with continuing to read your Bible and getting the meanings of all your words and your interpretation of, of it all from Masoretes. So that was just a, and that was an example of how if you're going to go on understanding your Bible based on the tools that there are today, you're going to have to keep coming back to the fact that they have been messing with the text and dictating what it means for so long that you can't trust what they're saying. You're going to have to do the work yourself. Now, I'm told by, by a lot of people that, you know, they're not good with language. I understand that. I do. There's a lot of things I'm not good with. But uh, I wasn't good with language when I started this either. And it, this was started six, eight months ago, lo just looking at these things. And I had like the, the most rudimentary knowledge of, say, ad hoc Hebrew, which means I had a very bad understanding of Hebrew. And this stuff has, I've had to, to acquire it more and more. Uh, in time, and it's only been about six or eight months. But uh, as a, in way of another illustration concerning how poor our understanding is of scriptures, based on not only textual criticism, but also on what the translators decided to do. I'm going to take a couple of words here real quick. I'm in Genesis 1. And over here on the next page, I'm still in Q Bible, and I'm going to make sure that it is sitting on Genesis 2, so that I've got the two I can kind of go back and forth in. And now in Genesis chapter 1, let's just take for example um, where it is that uh, Elohim creates a uh, these land land animals all right we can start with uh well here's a good word we can do this one this one's going to be big this one's going to be big probably bigger than some of the others okay um i pronounce it as he okay modern jewish says you should pronounce it as che so it's up to you i say he and it's 2416. So I can go back here to Blue Letter Bible in the Strong's. I've already got the H up, and it's 2416. I'm going to search for that. Now, certainly, all of our responsible Bible translators, since in almost any software, Blue Letter Bible, 
um, eSword, whatever, your standard default translation is going to be King James. And now the good people that did the King James translation, I'm sure they're going to stay very consistent with their terms as not to confuse us. So as I go through all of these instances of what I would say is he, but what the Jews would say is che, I see that we've got, let's see, it's life, it's living, it's living, oh, it's beast. Here it's living, there it's life, and already by Genesis 124, it's beast. Okay, Genesis 125, it's beast. Uh, Genesis 128, living thing. Genesis 130, beast, oh, and life in the same verse, beast, life. They did that earlier too, if you noticed. Oh, life, living, Okay, life, mm, beast, living, interesting. Beast, 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 life, life, living, life, 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 living thing, Noah's life, every beast. Are you seeing some consistency here? Because I'm not. But let's try another word. Now remember, I'm in Genesis chapter 1. And maybe Genesis chapter 2. We'll see if I get there. These are the origins of everything that we understand. Let's see if our translators have been faithful. Because I think just the example I gave to you, he, shows how unfaithful those people are or were. So let's try another one. Actually, I think this actually is a little bit more of a specific word than he. It is behma. Okay, um, let's see. The Jews that have you pronounce it Bahima. It's Behm. Uh, and it's 0929. So in Blue Letter Bible, we don't have to go 0929. We can just say H929. And search it. Here we go. Behm. And never mind their definitions, because their definitions stink and oftentimes are all over the place. So we got cattle, 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 beast. Oh, well, like, you know, cattle is a beast. But what about that he? That's a beast too, right? I mean, uh, oh, now I'm a little confused. Cattle, beast, beasts, beasts, cattle. Oh, cattle, 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 beast, cattle, beast, beast, cattle. Okay. Beast, 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 cattle, beast, beast, cattle, beast. Interesting. Cattle. Okay. Now, we, we have another one in this same verse. We have another couple, but we have one that's distinct, and it is Ramash. The Jews would have you pronounce it remes because they changed this shin to a sin. Ramash. And that is 7431 in Strong's. So I can scroll way back up the page and type in 7431 and search that. So, so far, uh, our good folks at King James have given at least two translations to one single word in two instances. <clears throat> so let's see what they do with Ramash. Um, oh, creeping thing, oh, creepeth. Okay, so they got it as a noun and a verb, creeping thing. Creeping thing, creeping thing, creeping thing. Creeping things, creeping things, creeping things. Moving things, creeping things. Hmm. Things creeping. Creeping things. Ah. So, all these creeping things. Interesting. Now, what I find is very interesting. Let's, uh. Ah, okay. Oh, but here, moving thing. In Genesis 9 3. Um, so, we're to believe that. Yahweh says, every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, 
even as the green herb have I given you all things. Uh, but then later on, when he gives his law to Israel, um, he restricts it again. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, uh, because I've seen a lot of odd things about this. Now, I just did Ramash. Now, in, in the next verse, we not only see... Well, actually, it might be in the verse before it. That's 7431. If we go... I want to say it's before, but I'm not sure. Here we go. Ramash. Now. Now they're saying it is a verb. Now it's move. It's creep. It's move. It's creep. It's creepeth. It's creepeth. Moved. Creepeth. Creepeth. Moveth. Creepeth. Moveth. And you've got these, by the way, in the waters and on the land. They're associated with many varied things. Now, what does that tell you at all? Does it help you understand the animals? Or the lives that were made in Genesis chapter 1 they're not even staying with much consistency if I would have kept going through he or you usually have like he nepash and um, various forms of those you'll find that they apply a multitude of English words depending on what they want to say about that. For instance, Napash. Do you know that you and I are considered Napash as well as sea animals, land animals? We're both considered He Napash, a living soul, both of us. But it's worse than that because of the type of translating that's been done and how many words have been used for words in Hebrew that are different we've got more confusion between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 than you can even imagine now <laughs> I'm here to tell you um, okay let's try this I'm here to tell you that if you just take a close look between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you're going to find because of the translators using similar or the same words for very different words between the two, that you don't notice usually when you're reading this that there are two different stories about what so far I can see as two different creations of man, two different ways in which they were created, two different types of creations of various creatures, and what they were created from and what they were created for two different kinds of plant life or vegetation and what they were for and the relationship of these things to the man who is created in Genesis 2 and one of the big differences of course is in Genesis 1 we have bara it's a different kind of creation word than what we typically see in two, which would be Yitzar. Very different words, bara and Yitzar. Here we've got it right here, Yitzar. So, just this, this little bit of checking on... Um, the similarities or dissimilarities in the source Hebrew between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 <clears throat> has revealed to me that between these two chapters we are talking about two different types of creation. 
we're not we're not talking about a story told over again now who knows how much because of just bad translating and English we're missing in Genesis who knows I mean, you know, um, I had to check on a reference in uh, Genesis chapter 11. And this one, this one you just get like, you know, this is a quick freebie for you. I think you might enjoy this. So, because I was checking on this reference, I was in 11. And this was the, you know, the part about the Tower of Babel and all of that. And I'm not even going to talk to you about the serious problems. Like, uh, first off, we've got uh, here, um, from, and, and then, um, Kadem, east, as they traveled from the east. Well, the mountains of Ararat are not only north of Shinar, north by northeast, they're definitely east of Shinar. He's... This says, as they traveled from the east, they found the plain. <laughs> really? Re that's interesting. Now, something that's even more interesting is, out of every reference I've checked with the LBN, Laban, everything I've checked so far is telling me that Laban does mean white. Now, what's interesting is what they find here is they say, and in English you'll see, and they said to one another, go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Really, that's very interesting. Because what they are doing here in the Hebrew is they're using these forms of Laban. You have n labana and you have Labanim. They're two different words. You have 3843 and 3835. Now, this root here, Laban, that means white. And what they're not telling you, you don't see it in the text, do you? You go find a Genesis text that says white brick. And the, the type of brick they were making was light brick. And there's probably a good reason why they're not including that in any texts. Did you know what the area of the world is that you can most abundantly find white brick in? Just some trivia real quick. They're predominantly made in because the materials for them are predominantly found in bum -ba -da, England. Now, you can find various white minerals that are used to make China over in you know china and areas in the east but that's not what we're talking about they weren't making the city or tower or whatever it is they were making because i'm not even sure about that anymore until i investigate the source text they weren't making that out of fine china they were making that out of ex very superior brick that was white that baked white and light and the most abundant source for those that we know of is in England. Check it out for yourself. So if you're content to continue to read your Bibles as they are presented to you, then there's nothing more I can tell you. As I said, this was going to be a dump. Um, the information I was giving here, I, I don't even have good notes about what I was going to do here, but there's so much that I'm seeing all the time. I, I just did my best to dump a lot of it out. Um, <sighs> it's amazing, and I couldn't stress enough. It is a gold mine. It's absolute gold mine there's so much to be known you know and and if we if we put our excuses aside and dedicate ourselves to knowing this stuff to doing the work 
we're going to get rewarded. There's rewards for doing this. Good grief. I mean, that's... There's rewards for doing all kinds of good that we do. If you don't believe that, you just don't have any faith. Uh, I'm going to put my email address in at the end of this video. And if you would like to help, and that help will require work. Doing work, like as in the um, this uh, chart that I came up with for the archaeological finds it's going to take work if you're interested in doing that as opposed to just taking from the work of others and going on your merry way then send me an email and we'll talk and um, it will be appreciated believe me um, and if not you know I hope that in time that Yahweh the God of Israel changes your heart and that he saves you and well if you're saved and you're just extremely childish that he'll grow you up into the image of his son Yahshua the Messiah so that's that's all I got for you right now I'm, I'm so completely spent so I hope this has been um, edifying to all of you so um, until I see you again um, I don't know. I don't know. I hope you do well. And uh, if I could find out how to stop this thing. <laughs> because my screencast-o-matic controls have, have gone away. Where are they? Here we go. Now I'm going to stop it. All right, guys. Take care. Bye.